Well, this is quite a crowd, uh, although I like Dr. Hofpower's introduction on Aristotle and money. Those two things usually don't seem to go together, uh, but maybe I will bring them together. Whether or not this is profitable to you, we'll find out in due time. Uh, just a note, uh, there is a sign-in sheet going around for the Lyceum Scholars and Fellows. There's also a sign-in sheet going around for my class for extra credit, uh, so please maximize your utility and sign that sheet to make sure that you get the extra credit. Um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, so as Dr. Hofpower said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a book manuscript I've been working on slash obsessing about. There's not really much of a distinction between those two things when you're writing. Uh, but the genesis of this manuscript was a question put to me by uh, an economist. Right? In fact, uh, I don't think it would surprise those of you who know me that the path to this book actually began with me stepping out of my office and making a pun to the editor of a book series. Uh, and eventually we had a series of exchanges and he said, you know, I'd like you to write a book for me on Aristotle's economic teaching. So the question, of course, is does Aristotle have an economic teaching? And it would seem initially that he doesn't uh, because he only speaks about economic things in a very partial way, particularly book one, chapters eight through 11 of the politics. It's a very brief inquiry. Uh, it's not a whole huge book like The Wealth of Nations that Adam Smith produces, not a series of essays like David Hume on commerce. And the other thing that you might see if you read this discussion of business, uh, it's usually translated as business, the Greek is the money-making art. Uh, one of the things that you would think just by a quick read of it is that Aristotle ultimately thinks money-making is unnatural. Uh, and I think while he's harsh on money-making, uh, that's not quite the right way to read Aristotle. And so what I want to explain is that Aristotle does in fact have a complete economic teaching. But the key to understanding his economic teaching is that it's embedded in his political philosophy about the human good that spans his work in the Nicomachean ethics and the politics. Right, so kind of the, the big picture view of this is that economics is a part of political life for Aristotle. But if you want to understand political life for Aristotle, then the question you have to ask is what is the good of politics and economics? Right? And why would you read Aristotle to figure this out? He's not necessarily the easiest guy to read on this subject. Uh, but if you think about kind of most pressing political issues today, right? presidents, uh, we think about whether or not presidents will get elected or reelected based on what's going on in the economy. Right. People are always talking about the distribution of wealth in society and what type of regime is most conducive to the best distribution. Uh, and if, for those of you who study international politics, one of the schools in international politics, liberalism, talks about how if you increase economic interdependence, uh, over time the incentives to go to war become too high. Right? The cost is too high and so states will become more peaceful. So there's this assumption that if we increase economic ties, we will lead ourselves to a more peaceful politics. Um, but one of the implicit assumptions of this, whether we're talking about distribution of wealth or international commerce, is that economic good is the political good. Right? And Aristotle might say, hold on a minute, these two things might not be synonymous with each other. The other reason why you'd want to deal with Aristotle is because he is not afraid of directly confronting the moral question, what is the good? He's not going to hold up his hands and say, well, that's a value judgment and we can't touch that. He's going to confront it directly with philosophy. Right, so tonight's focus, because this is a huge book project and there are lots of threads to the argument, there are only two things I'm going to focus on. Um, but I encourage you at the end of this, I have about 25, 30 minutes of prepared remarks, right, to ask questions, whatever you'd like, uh, about Aristotle. It could be about some virtue if you'd like to do that. Uh, but my focus will be first and foremost on how Aristotle discusses the possibility of gain in economics is a moral problem for human desire. And the second component of the talk is to explain how Aristotle shows philosophy is the remedy to the problem of desire in human nature. Uh, so before I get into the argument, let me just make a quick note about the character of Aristotle's philosophy. Uh, first, he is subject to a litany of common complaints. First and foremost, he's dry. It's not like reading a platonic dialogue. It's very boring. Uh, and related to this complaint about Aristotle's philosophy, it seems that he just tells you common sense. 
And right, that was my very first impression when I read Aristotle's Ethics as a freshman in undergrad. Why do I need some 2,500-year-old text from a Greek guy to tell me I should be good and I should be virtuous, right? And you should care about who your friends are. It all seems like common sense. The other thing is that Aristotle is repetitive. You see several phrases kind of show themselves over and over. And you're like, well, why are you taking me on this circle? Uh, and then finally, uh, I like to think of this as there's question begging in Aristotle, or maybe to use more contemporary terms, good shaming, right? In the sense that my good is higher than your good. Right? And it just seems like Aristotle takes you on this endless loop of begging the question, what is the good, and never explaining that to you. Uh, and what I want to say is, as I explore, explore these questions of gain, the moral problem of desire, is that what Aristotle shows you, if you have the patience to read him as he wants you to read him, is that heavily theoretical philosophy is in fact practical, that it has an effect on your action if you are willing to take it seriously. Right, so let me start with the outline of Aristotle's inquiry into the money-making art from Book 1, Chapters 8 through 11 of The Politics. Right, so the first and foremost, the opening question of this inquiry is what is the relationship between household management Right, uh, and fair warning, I'm going to throw some Greek words at you. Right, so household management in Aristotle, right, oiko oikonomia. Right, what is the relationship between household management and the money-making art? Right, you might know oik oikonomia if any of you eat Dan and Oikos yogurt. Right? It's just house yogurt. It sounds very fancy, right? but oikonomia is the management of the household. Uh, we'll talk about the name of the money-making art in a little bit. Uh, and so the first thing that Aristotle has to establish is, well, what are the natural origins of the money-making art? As I said, people look at Aristotle's teaching and think he ultimately argues economics is unnatural. But that's not true. The beginning of all economics for Aristotle is acquisition. Right? You and I experience acquisition in food. In fact, animals in some way engage in economics because they too need to acquire food to survive. So that's our starting point. Everybody acquires food. Every living animal acquires food for its subsistence. Right, but human beings, we do a little bit more than just acquire food. Right, we don't all just engage in hunting and gathering. You might enjoy Aristotle's humorous reference to piracy as a form of acquisition. Right? It actually doesn't blame that way of life because it's a way of acquiring things. Uh, but we don't just acquire things directly. We also exchange things. Right, so the first step uh, in Aristotle's progression is you move from acquisition of food to what he calls the natural art of exchange. And the natural art of exchange occurs between households. Households for Aristotle are the first communities in political life. Uh, and so each household right, has some goods that perhaps another lacks. Right? Some households say somebody grows grain, somebody else grows corn. They exchange those things. Right? The household that grows grain needs corn and vice versa. That, according to Aristotle, is the natural art of exchange, where I give my grain to you for your corn to provide for what is self-sufficient. Right, but then the natural art of exchange grows into something else. Right, in fact, the principle of exchanging between households becomes exchange between cities or political communities, right, where some cities have more or less of some goods, uh, and they exchange those with one another. So you have a whole city that's very good at growing grain and a whole city that's growing corn. Because they are not entirely self-sufficient in these things, they exchange them with each other. Right? And this is the beginning of the money-making art, according to Aristotle. Uh, and here's where legal currency enters into the picture. Even though you're ultimately going to need to transport the grain or the corn, it's much easier to exchange a piece of legal currency Right, to say, I promise to deliver this to you if you deliver this to me. Uh, and so Aristotle says that the money-making art at this point comes into being according to Logos. Uh, I'm not saying this not just to be a pretentious Greek scholar, but uh, right, Logos in Greek is a very weighted term. Right? It is speech, it is reason, it is the rational account of the whole. So the first thing to understand is that whereas exchange in that natural art comes into being according to nature, the money-making art that uses legal currency comes into being according to logos. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it comes into being contrary to nature. 
right? In fact, it's facilitating a natural exchange. In fact, Aristotle says that money-making art, where we use legal currency to move goods into foreign places, started as being simply equal to the natural art of exchange. But over time, we have something else that enters the picture. Right? And the Greek here is the art of retail trade. And with the art of retail trade, uh, with experience and time, Aristotle says, money making became more of an art. And it was less about exchanging necessary things for the purpose of self-sufficiency and more about making or producing the most gain. Right? So here's just kind of a key takeaway to think about money for Aristotle. It facilitates natural exchange. Money making at its root is not unnatural. But when we start thinking about the gain of legal currency and not the exchange of things for self-sufficiency, that's the point where the money-making art, through the art of retail trade, becomes corrupted, where gain becomes the end and not the exchange of necessary things. So once gain enters the picture for Aristotle, the central question of this discussion of the money-making art and the politics changes. Because the question then becomes, why do some think the arts of household management and money-making are the same thing? Okay, so it's just an important point to emphasize. Once the art of retail trade and gain enters the picture, all the arts below it, so the money-making art, the natural art of exchange, and even household management, somehow get reoriented towards this end of gain. Right, so why is it that gain is a mistake that people can make about household management and money-making? Uh, and the first thing to note is that all exchange comes down to use. Right, so according to Aristotle, every piece of acquisition, right, anything you acquire, whether it's food, crop, money, has two uses. Right? And there is a proper, right, and again, I'm going to do, do some Greek for you here, just because I want you to see the way Aristotle continues to refine terms that are all related to each other. Right? Uh, ouk in Greek is just not. That's the improper use. So every piece of acquisition has a proper and an improper use. Right? Oikeia in Greek actually means properly one's own. So something belonging to the thing. So the example he gives is a shoe. The proper use of a shoe is to wear it. Although perhaps if a speaker is bad, perhaps even me, you might want to throw it at me. But that is not why a shoe exists. The improper use of a piece of acquisition is the exchange of something. Right, so take corn, for example. Corn exists to be eaten. It does not exist primarily to be exchanged. But you exchange it because you need to provide for self-sufficiency. Right, but these terms, again, we keep coming back to oikea as the root. So every piece of acquisition has a proper and improper use. Legal currency, then, because it facilitates the exchange of things, is fundamentally tied to the improper use of things. It's not to say it's unnecessary, but exchange is not the proper use of the things that you're exchanging. Whatever those things are have a use that belongs solely to them. So once you have kind of this distinction between uses, we then see that there are two distinct ends in the money-making art versus the art of household management. The money-making art tied to legal currency becomes about the increase of legal currency. And the art of household management, and this is where Aristotle has one of those fun moments where he says something very vague and leaves you hanging, says, well, it's for another end. Right? Well, gee, Aristotle, it might be important to figure out what the art of household management is for. Uh, one hint he gives of it, but doesn't quite refine it, is that uh, the household is a community for the sake of the needs of the whole day. Right? You can see why Aristotle would emphasize political community is a much different thing than exchange. The things that go on in the household, right, whether it's food or spending time with your family, those are continuous, they're enduring. Whereas you only engage in exchange when you're in need of something. It's not a continuous thing. And this is an important point to understand about Aristotle's teaching on community. What holds us together in community is much less external things and much more about how we understand our proper Right, going back to this because he uses it elsewhere, our proper and improper relations with each other. Right, so now, once we have money making turned towards increase, we see that there are two human mistakes about ends. 
that drive this, right? It seems like the arts make these changes on their own. But Aristotle says, actually, there are two human errors. Right? So the first error is that there is a desire without limit, and I want you to file this language away of without limit, because I'm going to keep coming back to it in later arguments. There is a desire without limit for, that is more serious about living than living well. In other words, you could become obsessed with self-preservation in a way that discounts the importance of living well. And your desire for that has no limit. Right? So Aristotle might look askance at the way John Locke emphasizes self-preservation as the work of reason in the second treatise of government. So that's the first mistake. You are too serious about living and not about living well. The second mistake, as it relates to living well, is that people think living well is all about the acquisition of bodily enjoyments, right? things that bring you immediate pleasure, right? whether it's liquor, drugs, Cheetos. I always like using Cheetos as an example. Right? You think that living well is fundamentally about pleasure seeking. Uh, and so Aristotle says, if money making doesn't provide this, right? if people find that money making will not provide these enjoyments for them, then they do something that's even more strange they start to use their capacities in a way that is contrary to nature. Right? So now it's about the use of themselves. Right? So like, I, would, I would sell my ability for puns for money. Right? Even though puns are for wit, they're for laughter, I'm using it improperly, not in a way that's according with nature, because I want bodily enjoyments. In some way, I'm going to use myself for that. And so Aristotle says these people who are more, more serious about living well make the mistake of thinking money-making is the end at which all things aim. So for those of you who've read the ethics, that phrase should sound familiar. Money-making becomes the good for those who are more serious about living well in relation to bodily enjoyments. Right. So now, to kind of get a, kind of a hint of what the moral issue at stake is and how we're going to figure out the relationship to Aristotle's teaching on the good, I told you I would tell you about the name for the money-making art. So the money-making art in the Greek is krematistike. All right, now, I'm going to break this down. It is literally, right? so the ek at the end just means the art. It is the art of kremata, which some translate as property, but literally means the useful things. Right, so the money-making art is the art of the useful things. And if I go down one step further, the root of this art is use or need, which of course begs the question, right, what is the use or need of money-making? What is the use or need of the economic things? Now, there are different ways that I could approach answering this question, but it's fundamentally going to come down to dealing with use. Right? And this is something where, no matter how I show you this in translation, if you don't see the Greek, you don't understand the moral argument that Aristotle's built this entire inquiry on. How do I resolve this? It might be tempting, right? It might be tempting to take kind of a grand view of politics and economics. All right, so uh, if you'll give me a little leeway, I'm going to read you several famous opening passages in The Politics and the Ethics to talk about ways that you could resolve this question that Aristotle ultimately does not take. So first, living and living well. Those are the mistakes that drive legal currency towards right, money-making art towards the pursuit of gain. So it would seem, if you remember the politics, Aristotle says the city comes into being for the sake of living and living well and that this is in line with the end of self-sufficiency. Right? On its own, looks like a very complete thought and sentence, but if you stop and think about it for a minute, you realize that self-sufficiency has not been defined. Right? In fact, Aristotle's thrown another question in your face, and it looks like common sense. But let me start with the opening of the politics, where it would seem that maybe we should resolve this in terms of community. So since we see every city is some community, and every community is set together for the sake of some good, for all do all things for the sake of what seems to be good. It's a heck of an aside, by the way. Since on the one hand, it is clear all communities aim themselves at some good. On the other hand, the most authoritative of all communities 
and the one encompassing all the others aims itself at the most authoritative of all goods, most of all. And this is what calls itself the city and the political community. So you might read Aristotle's politics and you say, well, if I can figure out that relationship between the household, the village, and the city, that natural progression, I'll figure out what to do with money making. But it turns out that after Aristotle introduces self-sufficiency in the perspective of community, he pulls the rug out from under you and says, well, actually, you know, human beings by nature are political animals. And this means not only do they have a natural desire and a need to live in community with each other, but they also hold this capacity. They hold logos. And through logos, they have sense perception of what is good and bad, just and unjust, pleasant and painful, advantageous and harmful. And he says community in these things makes a household in a city. So in short, by realizing that human nature, even though it's oriented towards community, is not community itself, but community depends on our capacity for logos, we have to figure out where that fits into life. Right? So we can't take the communal approach. We can't look empirically at the way communities are laid out to figure out what the use of the money-making art is. So let me take another tack. Right? Maybe justice surely could tell us something about how to deal with the use or need of money-making and as it relates to community. So this is from book three of the politics, right? And again, one of these elliptical sentences. Since in every science and art a good is the end, a greatest good or end is most certainly in the most authoritative of all of these. This is the political capacity, and a political good is the just, and this is the common advantage. So it seems to all the just is something equal, and up to some point they agree with the philosophic logoi, or arguments, in which boundaries were marked out concerning the ethical things. All right, well now we've got an issue. We can't really use justice to answer this question because now we've got to go back and look at the ethical things. We've got to go back and look at the ethical things to figure out what the good is in those. So then finally, right, I'm going to go to the beginning of the Nicomachean ethics. So we have, maybe this will solve our problem. Right? Every art and every inquiry, and likewise action and choice, seems to aim itself at some good. On which account it is, they have nobly displayed from themselves the good, that at which all things aim. And it's, a kind of, it's a very literal translation. It's hard to convey this. In the Greek, there is a middle voice for verbs. A middle voice means a subject acting on itself. Right? And so when I translate it this way, the idea that arts aim themselves, that inquiry aims themselves, is a very strange one. Right? And one of the things you notice if you look very closely at the first chapter of the Nicomachean Ethics is at no point does Aristotle speak in the first person. But he does speak in the first person at the beginning of the second chapter. And so this is where the inquiry changes. I'm paraphrasing one of these and then quoting directly. If there is some end we ourselves wish for on account of itself so that choosing does not go on without limit, right? again, without limit, this language keeps appearing in Aristotle, so that choosing does not go on without limit and desire is not empty in vain, this would be the good and the best end. Right? Now we are invested in the good, whereas the arts, inquiries, actions, and choices is impersonal. Now it's a question of what we desire how we choose our actions. And he says, and therefore with a view to life, would not the knowledge of this good hold great weight? And just like archers holding a target, might we more hit upon the needful? Right? The language of need always comes up in Aristotle as it relates to the economic things, as it relates to the political things. And it's at this moment, at the beginning of the ethics, in that shift from the impersonal character of the arts and sciences to the personal question of our desires and our actions, where we realize whether it's in community, whether we're talking about science or it's arts, we as human beings, right, as each person taken alone, right, are the constant. And we can only choose these things. We can only choose these arts, these sciences, these communities, based on our understanding of the good. And we cannot understand the needful apart from the good, according to Aristotle. Right. So now I'm begging the question, well, what is the good in the Nicomachean Ethics? And the standard reading of the Nicomachean Ethics is that the good is happiness. Right. Everybody talks about happiness as it is definitively the good in that work. 
And everybody knows the definition of happiness in the Nicomachean ethics as an activity of the soul according to virtue, uh, and particularly the most complete virtue, or if these are several virtues, the most complete virtues. That's the definition that operates throughout the entirety of the ethics. Uh, of course, in the ethics, there's a division into types of virtues. There are moral virtues and intellectual virtues. And roughly, the work is divided along those lines. The first five books speak to moral virtue. The second five books speak to intellectual virtue. Uh, because happiness is the end, it's also supposed that happiness is the work of the political art, right? that politics in some way uh, sets us up for happiness. And this art, as the political art, because it's architectonic, encompasses the art of household management. So we've got economics embod embedded within the political. There's also a seeming preference when we take the perspective of the political art for taking and preserving the good of an entire community rather than one alone. Right? So rather than each person's good, Aristotle goes so far to say at the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics that it's more noble and more divine to take and secure the human good for the city. Uh, but here's where I think it's a little misleading to think happiness is the good in the ethics. In fact, I will come out and say it that happiness is not the good in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. It is the idea that he uses to get us to think about where the good fits in to our lives. Right? The good is instead a natural first principle, and the Greek word for first principle is arche and an end. Now, by me saying that, you, are, you have every right to look at me and say, well, what the heck does that mean, and why is it practical? Right? Why are you going to lecture me on first principles, and how can I use an abstract first principle to figure out what's good for myself? So let me give some tentative characteristics of the good as a natural first principle in Aristotle's ethics. Uh, first and foremost, the good is a recognition of the order of how things hold together. Right, so for example, you can look at a plant, whether it's living or dying, and you can tell whether or not it's holding together. Right? It's been well watered, it's receiving sunlight. A plant, right, so these trees that are blooming right outside the window, that is a sign that it holds together. Right? A building that doesn't collapse holds together. It's the good of that building for it to stay standing. Of course, the much more complicated question is, what does it mean for a human being to hold together? It's very simple to look at a plant, very simple to look at a building compared to what it takes to get human nature to hold us together. Uh, but part of what the good is going to do for Aristotle is it's going to help us see things, it's going to help us figure out what to contemplate, and it's going to help us figure out what to do. Right. Now, as this relates to human nature, right, so I said the first principle is an RK. In book six of the Ethics, human nature itself is described as an RK. And Aristotle says, human nature is one of two things. It is either desiring intellect or thinking desire. Right? He doesn't side definitively one way or the other. But the question is, what is authoritative in human nature? Desiring intellect means intellect is the primary thing, but desire characterizes it. Thinking desire means desire is the primary thing, but thinking characterizes it. That's the choice about what human nature is. Right? So the question is, well, how do we figure that out? How do we get it to hold together? Uh, just a side note, by Aristotle's definition and characterization of human nature, we are not pure reason, so we're not Kantians, and we are not pure desire. We're not a bunch of Hobbesians. We are these two things thrown together. But just by me telling you this, that your intellect and desire need to be ordered according to the first principle, that's a very abstract way to talk about your good. And the question is, does Aristotle leave it there? Is that the best approach? And the answer, of course, is no. Right? Now we need to go back. We need to keep tying together other threads of his philosophy. So let me go to choice. Right, uh, and let's see. I'm going like, to take up this whole board with words. Um, does anybody have an eraser by any chance? No? OK. Uh, I will actually use my paper. Uh, all right. See, I just made philosophy even more useful than you thought. OK. So choice for Aristotle. Right. 
one word for choice. If you look at the ethics, it's the thing that precedes all action. Pro-iracis. Pro-iracis is choice, and that description of human nature as intellect and desire, that is how Aristotle defines choice. Right? This is itself an RK. Right? So let's look at what choice is. Choice is the RK or the first principle of human nature. Interestingly, in the Politics, Book 3, Aristotle says, the city is the work of friendship, which is the choice to live together. Right? Hold on to friendship because it's going to become very important very soon. But the no thing you should notice is that choice is the way that we get into political life for Aristotle. Right? That community that's a household and a city. In the politics, when Aristotle talks about the different communities in relation to each other, about wholes in relation to parts, he says that when you account for these things, so he's talking about how the household relates to the city. If a whole destroys, abolishes, or confutes itself, then the part will be corrupted or ruined. All right, so here I want to show you in the contemplative side that's coming out in Aristotle. When I said a whole destroys, abolishes, or confutes itself, I have Ireo. Choice is the root, right? Choice is choosing first, right? So when Aristotle talks about a whole destroying, abolishing, or confuting itself, choice is at work, right? If you don't understand a whole, you don't understand the way it relates to its parts. You undo it because you don't know how to order your actions. Right, so choice in some way, that relationship between intellect and desire, you've got to account for the whole. Again, don't be Kantians, don't be Hobbesians. You need to get intellect and desire right in relation to each other to understand them. Right, so every part, according to Aristotle, is defined by its work and capacity. So if we don't account for the parts, if we don't account for the parts of human nature at work in politics and economics, according to Aristotle's teaching, we ruin that part, right? So what's at stake if we don't properly understand what motivates our choices that guide political and economic life? Well, we actually destroy or confute ourselves, right? So this is the way Aristotle's philosophy works. He's constantly drawing you to this need to figure out how to hold yourself together. Final component. The thing that complicates choice the most, according to Aristotle, is pleasure and pain. Right, and he notes that when it comes to actions, right, when it comes to assumptions, pleasure and pain don't affect every assumption or every way of thinking you have. So for example, mathematical assumptions. Whether or not you find a triangle pleasant or unpleasant, your pleasure or displeasure is not going to refute the fact that a triangle has three points and contains 180 degrees. But when we start talking about practical assumptions and the choices you make for your actions, then it gets a lot messier, right? Because then pleasure and pain can come in and distort your understanding of whether or not what you're doing is in fact good for you. Easiest example, drugs. They seem pleasant, but they in fact destroy your nature. You think they're good, but they're not, right? Uh, but I point this out, this distinction Aristotle draws between practical and mathematical assumptions, because some of you might have noticed that economics and political sciences as fields have struggled to make the study of politics and economics more mathematical. From Aristotle's perspective, because all human things are guided by choice and by practical decisions and pleasure and pain corrupt them, you cannot take pleasure and pain out of the equation. You cannot just assume we're rational actors and not question what is the content of that acting. How is pleasure affecting our perception of the end at stake? Right, so we can't just use math to figure out how to deal with economics and politics. We're going to need to address the underlying moral question at stake. So let me kind of stick with this theme a little bit, right? Because in using mathematics, the argument for politics, uh, political science, and economics is that we are being more empirical. Right? So in Aristotle's ethics, there's a point where the empirical actually plays a very important role in getting to this moral question. Politics and household management, according to Aristotle, broadly fall under the umbrella of the virtue of prudence. Prudence is the virtue of choice, so it would say something to intellect and desire. 
Uh, and with respect to what it does, prudence is that by which we seek our own good. Right? So that goes back to the part I erased with oikeia, right? our own thing. The household is an extension of what is your own. Aristotle raises the question that one's own well-being seems to be impossible when it's detached from household management or a regime. Now, the empirical way I could focus on this is, well, why don't we look at the communities? Let's look at the household as a community and study what's going on there. Let's look at the city as a community and study what's going on there. But Aristotle does not take his inquiry in that direction. Instead, he raises an issue. He says, why is it that the young Right? Uh, and I'm not picking on you, although this is a STEM school, it actually fits. The question Aristotle raises is why is it that the young can be very wise in mathematical things but not be prudent? Uh, now some of you may have attained prudence at your young age. I know I certainly have not. Right? But this is the question Aristotle raises. Why is it that the young are not prudent but mathematical uh, assumptions and first principles, they have wisdom in them? And Aristotle says, well, it seems to be because of experience. Right? You guys just haven't had experience yet. If you have more experience, you would be more prudent. But Aristotle says, that might not be quite right. What's at stake is, for some reason, right, you trust mathematical first principles more than you do, as he says, natural first principles. The natural first principles being related to your good. Right, again, I could draw a triangle on the board, and you immediately would assent to it being a triangle, and you wouldn't doubt it. Right? The trust is in the abstraction. But we don't trust principles about our own good that we learn from experience. In part we, because we have that messy problem of desire and pleasure creeping into the picture. <coughs> right? So the question then becomes, how do we get this trust in natural first principles? Where does this experience come from? Now if I back up to book one of the ethics, this is Aristotle, this statement I just told you about the young in book six harkens back to a problem in book one. Right, so the political art in book one of the ethics presents logos about the human good. And Aristotle does something that is funny. And yes, there are jokes in Aristotle, even though you might really have to dig to get them. Uh, but Aristotle says, well, the young really aren't proper listeners of the political art because they're without experience. And then you think, well, wait a minute. Of all the people who would need to know these speeches, this logos about the human good, wouldn't it be the young, right? Why are you just tossing them out? But then Aristotle catches himself. No, no. It's not a matter of age. It's a problem of character. It's a character that knows only how to live by passion. But if the young knew how to order their desires, according to logos, right? And in fact, the Greek word is make or produce their desires according to logos, then logos would in fact be beneficial for them, right? So it's not just that you lack experience, it's that you haven't figured out how to order yourself. You haven't figured out a way to hold yourself together, right? So now up against empiricism, like that focuses on math, that focuses on the study of things, I'm going to present to you Aristotle's account of philosophic empiricism. This is either really exciting or really boring. Uh, I think it's exciting. I want to get American Eagle shirts that say AE just so I can say, well, it means Aristotelian emp empiricism and see if it catches on. I, uh, but in book one of the ethics, right, so after he raises this statement about the young not being able to listen to Logos, he says, you know, Plato raised a very good question. He says, Plato was well perplexed about how to approach Logos and first principles in Logos. In particular, should Logos proceed towards first principles or from first principles, right? Induction or deduction. And the image Aristotle gives is that of athletes on a race course who run from the judges to the finish line and back to the judges. And Aristotle says, for our part, we are going to begin from the things known to us. Right, so it's going to be induction. Now, there are a lot of puns at work in this description. Right? And I promise you, it's not just my predilection for puns uh, that helps me see this. So the word, first thing to know, right? the way you see this in English, the finish line is... 
paras, its limit. Right? I kept telling you about this language of limit being without limit. Something without limit, according to Aristotle, It's aperon, it means without limit, but the problem with the young, they're also without experience. It means the same thing, right? So the finish line that you proceed towards or from to understand first principles is a limit in and of itself, right? But the young, they are without experience. Desire is something that is without limit, right? We need to balance these two things. All right, next part. Well, what is experience in Greek? Empeiria. Right? You see this root showing up again and again. Right? You need experience to know your own good. But literally, if I break this down to its root, experience means to be en peras, in limit. What's Aristotle doing with you the whole time he's taking you through this inquiry? He tells you, well, we're going to proceed from what we know. But what, in fact, he's doing is he's bouncing you between first principles, towards and from the limit. So the remedy for the young who lack experience is to give them philosophic experience in thinking about first principles. And you see this over and over in Aristotle. Right? We'll start from the good. But maybe it's happiness. Maybe it's the just. No, maybe it's political community. Maybe it's the city. Maybe it's the household. His inquiry goes both ways. Last part of this, right? he praised Plato for being rightfully per perplexed. Aporia in Greek means perplexity. Right? It's very similar to aperon, without limit. But here's the interesting thing. At root of aporia is the verb, right, the root por. Porizo is to provide. Economics provides. Here is where Aristotle's philosophic empiricism shows itself. Philosophy actually provides for you. Doesn't seem that way. It doesn't give you money. But what does philosophy provide? What does a philosophy that's contemplating the good and moving towards and away from it do? It provides you experience in the limit of the good. Right? Philosophic perplexity actually provides for human nature. Right? All of this, very difficult to see in the English, but Aristotle's playing with these terms all the time. Right? So philosophy gives us experience in the limit, in the first principle needed to order our desires so that the logos is beneficial. The question, though, is where in the ethics does the good as a first principle show itself more, most clearly? Where do we naturally see the good as the end of our actions, according to Aristotle. So my recommendation is to look closely at the discussion of friendship in the ethics. Right? Friendship in the ethics sits between two accounts of pleasure. And again, pleasure is the problem that affects our choice of the practical things. The first account of pleasure is in the back end of Book 7, where Aristotle introduces the, philosopher, the political philosopher as someone who contemplates pleasures and pains. He also says the political philosopher is the architect of the end in relation to which all things are said to be simply good or bad. Right, so now I move to the discussion of friendship. There are three forms of friendship, according to Aristotle. The useful, the pleasant, and the good. Right, so now the useful shows itself. But Aristotle says the useful is not properly an end. Because the useful is always for the sake of something good and pleasant. Right, so the money-making art as a useful thing, begs the question of what good is it useful for? And for Aristotle, there are only two choices when it relates to human nature. Is it pleasure or is it the good? So he dismisses the useful as an end. Now we have pleasure and the good set in competition with each other, but we've got to figure out a way that we choose the good over the pleasant. Otherwise, we screw up every political choice that we make. So Aristotle, towards the end, in Book 9 of the Discussion of Friendship, finds a more natural view of friendship. And from the more natural view of friendship, virtue kind of drops out. Everybody talks about virtue in Aristotle's ethics. The more natural view of friendship is that it's community and logos and thought, right? Speeches and thoughts that you share with people. 
the basis of that is the intellect for Aristotle. Right? So I've been telling you about intellect and desire in very abstract terms, but now it's become concrete. Human nature for Aristotle is such that you are what you think. There are better and worse things to think about. Right? Call of Duty is probably not as good to think about as right, your own good. Right? Now that's a very extreme example. You might say Call of Duty is your own good, and I, I affirm your life choices. Well, not really. Right? I don't think it's good for you in the long run. Right? But no matter whether it's drinking, whether it's listening to music, you talk about these things. You hold them in community, in speeches and thoughts with your friends. Right? But some things are better to hold in community than others. Right? So the question is, what type of thing can you think about most continuously? Aristotle holds wisdom up as a model. But again, anything that you can think and talk about is the basis for friendship. What he's looking for is something that will make your friendships endure. And here's where desire comes in. Right? Our desire for friendships is for them to endure and for our need to have a good that we can hold in common with others. Right? So once we get that image, that more natural view of friendship, Aristotle revisits pleasure again. And he says, well, pleasure, it seems like it's an absolute thing, but it turns out it's always relative. Right? The pleasure of listening to music is not the same as the pleasure of drinking. It's not the same as the pleasure of conversation. How you hold yourself in relation to an activity brings a pleasure exclusive to that. Right? So the question again is what type of pleasures are most enduring? Now selection bias, Aristotle would say, it's philosophy. Right? Uh, but the argument there is that thinking about the good, what holds all things together, is the best thing that you could share with anybody to hold together. And recognizing that that is human nature's fundamental need means that you can't provide for us solely through external things. You need to find a way to hold yourself in relation to something enduring. Right, so the last thing I'll say, um, and I realize I've gone on way longer, surprise, surprise. Right? When I write, I do this. When I talk, I do this. Uh, let me take a quick look to justice. Right? Why does friendship matter for justice and for economics? Well, it turns out if you look at the discussion of justice in Book 5 of the Ethics, the most general form of injustice is a grasping for more, a wanting to hold more of something for yourself. And the roots of injustice, according to Aristotle, are a mistake about your own good. Right, so I fast forwarded to friendship, where the question of your own good is most clear, to show that justice is somewhat of a dead end in the ethics, if you think that's the end. It points to this question of how to deal with your own good. Right, the other thing to note, Right, so this desire for grasping for more, this explains why the money maker wants gain. It's a misunderstanding of what pleasure to pursue. The other thing to emphasize, right, Aristotle in Book 8 says, those who are friends have no need of justice, but those who are just still need friendship in addition. Right. Justice is not everything. Right? It can hold together communities, but it can't speak to your own good. In fact, the problem with justice is that it's more about somebody else's good than your own. And then finally, Right, justice is a matter of political philosophy and the ethics because everybody orders a community according to what they think good. The oligarchs think it should be wealth. Democrats think it should be freedom or equality. But all of that, according to Aristotle, is again, them thinking their own good should govern the community. Right, but it's their errant ordering of desire that leads them to grasp for more of justice for themselves. Right, so whether it's in politics or economics, for Aristotle, what you fundamentally have to understand is that the thing that drives us into conflict, desire, cannot be satisfied in any external way. The only way to satisfy it is serious contemplation of your own good. Right. With that, I will open the floor to questions. Russell. For him, yes. Uh, but I will say that you can find other ways to get at this argument. So, um, right, for example, I've seen uh, in one of his books, Pope Benedict XVI, actually makes the same argument. In order to satisfy people's desires, what they need is religion or faith. But then it's a question of reason versus revelation, right? Do the two complement each other? That's another way to go about it. But for Aristotle, he doesn't have revelation like we have it. 
So for him, philosophy is the only proper remedy because philosophy is open to thinking about the whole of things. Right? In fact, that's the mistake politics and economics make. When you take a part and try to make it whole, right, Aristotle stresses, think about the whole of human nature. Think about the whole of community. And philosophy as the love and the friendship of wisdom is open to that in the way that if I just confine myself to politics and economics, I wouldn't be. Make sense? <coughs> Anthony. So would Aristotle say that you have to have experience in order to be able to fully understand this argument, or maybe just in order to be able to implement it in your own life? Or how does that play into this? You know, you'd need, at the very least, philosophic experience. Um, Right? We tend to think of experiences as just, just do things. In fact, the discussion of moral virtues. Right? If you just start doing the moral virtues, you'll be that way. Uh, but it turns out that there's a whole set of thinking behind them that you need to figure out. So it's not just about doing things. In fact, if you do things through experience, they could turn out badly. Right? Go back to what happens with the art of retail trade. With experience and time, it became more of an art concerned with gain. Right? Experience alone is a double-edged sword. Right? So for Aristotle, it's not just you practice things and you get really good at money making or you get good at virtue. It's experience in the sense that you are in the limit of things, that you are thinking in relation to the end. So at the very least, right, do things. Like don't sit around and be a couch potato. You obviously need to do to live. But the proper experience for him would be contemplative experience. Thank you. You're welcome. Evan. Yeah, uh, in fact, um, so he uses a slightly different word, which is liberality. Uh, Eleutherios in Greek, so it's actually the word is freedom in and of itself. Right? So there's the virtue of liberality, which thinks about proper and improper ways to gain money, but also to spend it. Right? And then there's a grander virtue of liberality, which is magnificence. Right? So it's like really rich liberality, where you make an extravagant expenditure for the public good. In fact, Aristotle says you do something noble or beautiful to inspire contemplation. I think the root of freedom right, at the root of liberality is very important for understanding Aristotle's teaching because the person who can give of his own goods, right? in fact, the Greek, he alternates between kind of kremata, his property or money, and usia, substance. Right? In fact, giving your own goods is in a way giving your substance to somebody else. That is a certain freedom, right? Whereas, so if, I, if I'm a good Lockean and I think about holding on to my money, right? Holding on to my property, because it doesn't violate the natural law if I hoard, hoard legal currency, right? With Aristotle, there is a freedom, right? There's a fear of loss in Locke. With Aristotle and liberality, it's a freedom in giving. Right? It's a freedom with external goods to where you are not bound to trying to hold on to it as much as possible. And so there, Again, never understand him as teaching money making is unnatural, but understanding that money making exists to facilitate the human good. And there is a certain freedom in the human good that somebody who is prodigal, right, so that's the excess of liberality, just wastes his resources, or somebody who's a miser and holds on to money doesn't understand. Right? But it is a very important virtue, right? In fact, in his criticism of the regime of Plato's Republic, if you look at book two of Aristotle's Politics, one of the things he criticizes for Socrates' argument that everybody holds property in common is that it robs the people of the opportunity to engage in two great political virtues, liberality and moderation. By people having their own things, they can be free with them right, and show a certain flourishing. Michael. How it would be applicable today in our capitalist society. Um, it seems that you need to make as much money as possible to be able to success. So if you start curbing how much money you're able to make, wouldn't that set you behind? Well, okay, so. Because not everybody's going to follow this philosophy. Right, right. So the question is should I curb the money people make so that they keep their desires in line? Is that yeah, the. Well, if I follow that same philosophy, how does that help me more if I'm running a business? As Make as much money and pursue as much gain as possible. Yeah. Well, one, 
run your own things well, right? Oikonomike is about the care of your own things. The other thing, just to relate to that, so this actually comes up in the criticism of Phaleas's regime. Uh, in book two, I think this is chapter seven of the politics, Phaleas proposes that to get rid of faction in the city, to get rid of crime, we're going to give everybody equal property. And Aristotle says, well, wait a minute. That's not really the issue. Because you've got to set the number, what's the equal property to begin with, but the more important criticism, and this is where Aristotle says this explicitly in the politics, the nature of desire is without limit. Inequality is the product of desire. And unless you find a way to deal with desire, and there he says philosophy is a remedy for people who seek painless pleasures. And at the time you're like, what the heck does that mean? But hopefully this talk has given some indication of what Aristotle means by that. That philosophy puts you in the limit of thinking about the good that gets you away from clinging to your desires and thinks about living freely and contemplatively. Right? But the externals, right? So anybody who proposes, well, let's set a certain amount of wealth in a regime, according to Aristotle, that will never address the problem because the problem is in human nature. That needs a limit. Not wealth, right? human beings, they need an end. Does that help? Um, I'm curious to know the role of lot of what he's talking about requires a lot of habit and personal discipline, which a large number of people are never going to take that. Um, so if that's the case, to Aristotle, is there a role then for the community, for the government, to coerce people who aren't willing to pursue that good into pursuing it? It's not truly pursuit of the good if it's forced. Right? Uh, this is why it's so important to stress that friendship is the key to Aristotle. Right? Friendship is a form of love. What type of love is it if you compel somebody to love you as a friend, right? Be my friend or I'll shank you. It's like, no, right, well, why, right? Hobbes would say that's a voluntary choice, by the way, right? My rants against Hobbes, <laughs> it's another day, we can talk about it, right? But you have to freely choose the good. It doesn't mean anything if it's imposed on you, right? Or even, so the whole discussion of moral virtues where it's a habit, and Aristotle says, we are going to assume for the sake of discussion that this is in accord with correct reason, correct logos. And he says, but we won't talk about what this is. And then in book six, he says, oh, you know, we assumed everything was in accord with correct logos. Maybe we need to figure out what that is. Right, there is a way to act, and there's a way to think about governing actions that emphasizes that you tell people what to do and they follow. Right, but in order for people to truly pursue their good, they have to do it freely. They have to choose it because they in fact understand why it's good for them. Right? That's why that experience, being in the limit of thinking about the good, it, it's not just a kind of a regimented habituation to where right, if you think about this, like if you put earphones on, sleep at night, think, just hear the good over and over and over, that you'll wake up in two weeks and know how to pursue the good. It's a, an understanding, a contemplative understanding that the good as an end is in fact the way to order yourself. And once you choose it and know why you choose it and reject something as bad, you will hold it. Otherwise, somebody else holds it for you. But that's not free. And according to Aristotle and Plato, for that matter, philosophy frees you to pursue the good and love the good. Help. Oh, that was too many. I think, Luca, you had your hand up first. Um, so it seems like Aristotle would say that um, our current uh, economic situation is completely corrupted, but it seems it seems like in the United States this sort of limit that there was a limit in economic commerce, and it was Christianity. Like Christianity was a limit in all of our, you could say, in the, in the United States. For it was the end to which we all kind of, as a as a community, it was the structure by which we followed and, and pursued an end, but. With the now that we're in a postmodern age, I would argue, what what is the limit now in our, especially in our, in our economic uh, affairs? And if there is none, what is what is going to happen? I should have prefaced all of this, but maybe it's good that I tell this now. I have no training in economics. Uh, <laughs> I, I am writing this purely to figure out what economics is all about. Um, so what's the limit now? I don't know. 
I, I look at things, right? And, and even David Hume and Adam Smith, right? So they would look at international politics where countries rack up trillions of dollars in debt. David Hume and Adam Smith argue that is immoral, right? But you, well, I don't, what's our debt at now? Like 25 trillion? Some insane number, right? They argue it's immoral. And it just seems countries around the world are like, it doesn't matter, it's not real anyways. It right? might as well be wizardry. Uh, so I think there's a way that this carries on without limit. Um, but that, this is kind of the, the temptation is, right? We like to think of economics and politics as these things beyond our control. Right? That's why when Aristotle starts with the arts and communities, it's like, oh, it's so big, where do we fit into this? But each person pursuing his or her own good Right. Is there a definite limit? Right. Has there ever been a definite limit that universally people follow? Maybe when Christianity was more dominant, sure. But it all came down to people's understanding of their own good. Now Aristotle's argument is that if you think about human nature, this is true regardless of time, regardless of culture. Right? The limit here is understanding you are a contemplative being and your capacity for logos gives you access naturally, objectively to what's good. That's always open as a possibility, right? But you could, you could look anywhere, or you couldn't, right? You could just be like the 2008 financial crisis with the mortgage-backed securities, and people are like, let's run it up, right? Let's, let's make as much as possible. That's always a temptation, but as Aristotle shows, the love of gain has always been present. It just manifests itself in different ways. Uh, but he would argue if you push yourself contemplatively, you will realize there is, in fact, this natural limit. But you have to be open to it. But I can't force you to be open to it. So, I don't know if that helps you, but it, it does. Okay, Casey. I think I, I have a couple stages to my question. Um, the first one is: um, Would you say that um, in Aristotle's teachings, uh, the ultimate or one of the ultimate vices of humanity is greed? Like one of the worst tendencies of humans is. Yeah, it's one of the big ones. So when he talks about grasping for more, that is a general form of injustice. And then if you look closely at Book 5 of the Ethics, he says, but we're going to only narrow it down and focus on certain parts of justice and injustice. Okay. And um, so if you have to voluntarily choose to follow the good for it to truly be good, and yet this, um, this injustice that is... Uh, greed and selfishness is so rife throughout humanity. What does that leave for those who are good and who are just? Um, it's it's like uh, it's kind of in line with the nuclear armaments discussion. How do we, if the right thing to do is for all countries to abandon nuclear armaments, and we do it, that leaves us defenseless against those who say, "No, I'm just going to keep mine. I want to be more powerful." Um, like, what do the good do in that scenario? Well, this is the Machiavellian temptation. Right? A man who wants to make a profession of good in all regards must come to ruin among so many who are not good. But then it's really not just the Machiavellian temptation, because if you read Plato's Republic, right, Glaucon and Adamantus make the argument, well, nobody actually cares about justice as justice. They only care about it because they don't want anybody to do injustice to them. But if they could get away with it, they'd do it. Right? So that throws us back to Socrates, which I think is very much on Aristotle's mind, that regardless of whether or not your preservation is at stake, there's something to be said for trying to be good, even though others won't. Right? Machiavelli would say, that's foolish. But Plato and Aristotle would say, right, um, not in these terms, I don't know what the Greek for it would be, how do you, how do you live with yourself at the end of the day? Right? Are, do you cling to the good only because it's useful to you, to get some type of advantage over others, or do you choose it because you, in fact, love it and want it? And if other people disregard it, right, if it's truly love of the good, so be it. Right, it might be dangerous, right? And I admit, the, the prospect of having my self-preservation threatened, right? I could say now, yes, I would love the good no matter what. I might panic. No, no, I would panic, right? Uh, but the good should be the good. If you think it is the good by nature, then damn the consequences of what other people think because it is naturally and objectively good. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. We hope to see you Thank again you. soon. Thank you. Thank you.